the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 1.5 billion. So we're five times past that. So if everybody on the Earth chose to live as actually we do in Northern Europe and in the United States, by the middle of the century when we'll be now, we're going to need five more planets to make that work out. On current patterns of production and consumption, well, can be solved, but they're all the product of humanity. It, this isn't the dogs and the cats creating the problem. It's us creating the problem. And we're creating these problems and challenges for our own well-being by the very powers that I want to applaud, which are the powers of creativity. The reason is that human beings don't live in the world like the rest of nature does. We do in most respects, but in one respect we don't. We create the world that we live in. I mean, we live in the physical world, clearly, but we also create worldviews. We create values and systems of culture, beliefs and expectations, which mediate between how we see the world and how we act in the world. Other creatures on the whole don't do this. You don't see, for the most part, dogs and cats having theoretical arguments uh, about how to go about their business. We do because of the very gift I'm talking about, the gift of, of creativity. So what is it? And what's education got to do with it? I think there are three key terms we need to think about. Uh, one of them is imagination, the second is creativity, and the third is innovation. And they all, I think, have to be developed systematically. This is, what I think, why I'm going to say in education. Our current systems are based on three principles which contradict, in my experience, how people actually live. The first is conformity. Most of our systems of education are about conforming to set expectations and standards. Actually, Human life is characterized not by conformity, but by diversity. How many of you, can ask, have got children of your own? All right. Or grandchildren? All right. And the rest of you have seen such children. Small, <laughs> small people wandering around. I'll make you a bet. If you've got two children or more, I'll make you a bet. My bet is that your children are completely different from each other. Aren't they? You would never confuse them, would you? Like, which one are you? Remind me. Because human life, like the rest of life on Earth, is inherently diverse. Our systems of education don't celebrate diversity, they promote conformity. It's why so many people disengage and go through education feeling that they're not very smart as a consequence, because they don't conform to the dominant expectation. The second is compliance. On the whole, education wants compliance, and human life is driven by creativity, which I'm coming to. And the third is our systems are about linearity, whereas human life is organic. How many of you now, can I ask you, are doing with your lives exactly what you thought you'd be doing when you were 15? It's not so many, is it? I mean, you may be in the right, a sort of occupation you had in mind, but this job, these things, this biography, the reason is that you create your life. Creativity is as fundamental as that. Imagination is the power to bring to mind things that aren't present. Creativity is the process of doing something with that power. Let me show you this quick picture. What is that? What? Thank you very much. That was it. <laughs> no, it's been confusing me for weeks, so I thought that... <laughs> They'll know it best. <laughs> See, what's interesting about this is there was a study done a while ago of cultural differences in visual perception. And in the study, they sat people down, showed them hundreds of images on a computer screen, and asked them to say what it was. They also wore a, a little camera which tracked their eye movement so they could see what they were attending to in the image. They anticipated there may be some differences. There were. They were comparing people from Southeast Asia to people from North America. What they found out was this. The people from North America, from which you could probably read Northern European too, Western culture, seeing an image like this, very similar to this, and asked what it was, they said, without thinking, it's a tiger. And there's a tiger right there. People from Southeast Asia typically didn't say that. I don't mean they never did. They just normally didn't. What they typically said was something like, it's a tiger in a jungle, or it's a jungle with a tiger. Or, as often as not, it's a jungle. 
and they didn't mention the tiger at all. Now, I'm not saying they're right and we're wrong, this is good and it's bad, or you are if it's Southeast Asia. It's just a difference. But it's an important difference. Because what it shows is that even our beliefs about what we're looking at are soaked in culture. And the speculation is that in Southeast Asian cultures, there's a much more nuanced sense of relationships and families and hierarchies and complexities. So that they tend to look <coughs> Western cultures are driven by a sense of individualism and the subject. <coughs> It goes to what we think the subject of the picture is, and we mention that and don't mention anything else. Now, I say it's not right or wrong, it's just the difference. But if culture gets between our eyes and the world around us, how much more complicated is its influence on the thoughts that pass through our minds as a consequence? In the end, all of human life is a creation. We think about the world as we do because of the cultures we're part of and the language that we develop. It's never neutral, and in fact, some of the greatest challenges we now face on the planet are to do with cultural differences, as much as they are economic or environmental. I mean, look what's happening at the moment on the planet. The deep conflicts on how we see the world and what we think matters in the world, and the extent to which we dismiss the way other people see them too. So given the rate of technological change and demographic change, and the fact that human life is created, investing in creativity seems to be giving absolutely fundamental. So let me define it. I define creativity as the process of having original ideas that have value. Creativity is not some marginal concern. It's essential to the four basic purposes that education has to meet. The first of them is economic. These are in reverse order. Uh, when I say economic, I think we all expect that we, if we get educated or our kids do, They'll be able to find a job and get work, don't we? We expect that. If they're educated, our kids may become economically independent. I think we want that, don't we? I do. I can't tell you how much I want my children to become economically independent. And as soon as possible. The problem is our current systems are designed for the old industrial economy, not for the new economy. And there's a raft of reports I need to take with you to explain why that's the case that in the new world economies, innovation and creativity are fundamental strategic powers. The second fundamental purpose of education is social. We need forms of education which engage our children in the world around them, the social systems. You know, uh, well, I think for a general election here in this country is it in May. In America, in Los Angeles where I live, uh, there was recently a vote for the mayor. I think they had a 15% voter turnout in a country where people have died for the right to vote. There is at the moment a mass withdrawal from public and political institutions, and we literally can't afford them. The third function of education is cultural, but the fourth is personal. In the end, education is about people and their powers and their abilities. And in recognizing that, we have to rethink the nature of talent. I published a book a while ago called The Element. Do you know this book? It's really good. It's called The Element. How finding your passion changes everything, and it's about the nature of talent. But the thing I want to mention here is that our school systems, for historical reasons, are based on a narrow conception of talent. Consequently, very many people who prove to be uh, highly successful in their own chosen field ended up not having done very well at school. Not true of all of them, but it's often the case. Um, it's true of a lot of people in the arts, particularly. It's also true of quite a few people in the sciences. But it illustrates something else here, which is that we often overlook talents because we're looking for something else. Have you heard of somebody called Bart Connor? Anybody? But Bart Connor, I interviewed him for the book, he's fantastic. He, uh, he grew up in a place called Morton Grove, Illinois. He's about 40, in his 40s now, anyway. When he was a kid, when he was seven or eight, he discovered that he could walk on his hands as easily as he could walk on his feet. We don't know how he discovered this, but he did. And, and then he discovered he could walk up and down the stairs on his hands as easily as on his feet. Again, he, he said it wasn't much use, but he was in constant demand, you know, at children's parties. You know, whenever the party slowed down, his father would say, well, I can not see And off he went. Nobody thought much about it, but his mother did. When he was 10, his mother spoke to the school in Morton Grove, Illinois, 
and asked if they could take Bart to the local gymnastics centre. And they did. And he said he will never forget the feeling he had as he walked through the doors of the gymnasium. I said, what was that? He said, it was intoxicating. I said, why? He said, well, there were war bars, there were ropes, there were trampolines, uh, there were vaulting horses, there were rings. He said, I'd never seen anything like it. It was like a cross between Disneyland and Santa's Grotto. To him. He said it was intoxicating. Can I ask you, by the way, is that how you feel when you walk into a gymnasium? Do you find it intoxicating? Looking round, not all of you. I don't. I, mean, I don't, I can tell you. I mean, on the contrary, I need to get intoxicated. If I, if I spend more than 20 minutes at gymnasium, but, but he loved it. And he went every day, practiced hard, and 10 years later, he walked onto the mat at the Montreal Olympics, representing the United States in the male gymnastics squad. He went on to be the most decorated male gymnast in American history, he lives now in Oklahoma, North Oklahoma, which is how I know him. He's married to Nadia Komenech. Do you remember Nadia Komenech? First perfect 10 in women's gymnastics. They have a beautiful little boy called Dylan, after Bob Dylan. Why not Bob? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> what comes to spending life upside down, presumably, I've no idea. They have their own gymnastics centre, and they are both prominent members of the World Special Olympics movement. So between them, they've helped to create opportunities for hundreds of thousands of athletes with special needs. Now, I'm telling you for two reasons. One is that none of that would have happened if his mother hadn't encouraged him when he was 10. You know, his mother might have said to Bart, but Bart, we've had it with the hands thing. Like, we get it. We've run out of parties. Stop doing that now and get on with your homework. <laughs> But she didn't. She encouraged him. But the thing is, even in encouraging him, she had no idea what would be the consequence. There is no way they walk through the doors of that gymnasium, the road that they're headed. Because you can't see it that way. Because life is not linear, it's organic, and you create your own life as a consequence of the talents that you discover inside yourself and the opportunities that you go on to create, to take, or to move away from. You know, I'm quite sure that Bart's mother did not think when he was seven, oh, here's Bart, he could do this hands thing. I gather there's this girl in Romania. I have a Bob Dylan album. You know, <laughs> my whole plan is coming together beautifully here. The fact is, you can only account for your life retrospectively. You can't plan it out prospectively. You can have goals, you can have aims, but you will almost certainly be buffeted by unknown turbulence in your life and unknown opportunities. And that's where education begins to clash with this sense of it. So I want to create at the centre of this for personal reasons, so that people have a life to live because they discover the talents that they are gifted with, and we all have them. Secondly, it's essential that we develop a deeper sense of cultural awareness and sensitivity through the creation of Thirdly, it's essential because we need to rethink our social systems, how we involve people in them, and it's vital for economic development. In all of these things, there's an intimate relation with technology. Let me just show you a couple of things here. Um, creating is about challenging what you take for granted. There are two sorts of creativity, as I said, broadly speaking. Creativity is what the element's about. There's general creativity, which is about developing skills of thinking differently, seeing alternative ways of doing things, and um, putting things together in interesting new ways. The element's about the first, out of our minds is really about the second. But I thought you'd like this, I came across this. Some of you, I think, I think that the subtitles here are in Dutch, so you, uh, I think I'm right about that, you'll tell me if I'm wrong. This is a very little experiment, uh, a very short experiment they did, the whole group of people, to ask them to solve a problem. The problem is that there's a nut stuck in the, in, at the bottom of the tube and they have to get it out. That's, that's the problem. They film loads of people to see if they could work out. Have you seen this? I did like it. It's called Going Nuts. Lee, can we run this video? Dutch. Thank you very much.
wonderful thing at international conferences. <laughs> See if you can work it out. this recently, which I love. Um, you'll forgive if you would. It, it was made by a company, so it's a very short video, but forgive the commercial at the end. Focus on the 90% that leads up to the commercial. But I think you'd like it. This is an example of technologies expanding our minds. Uh, could you play the mind on video later? At 83 million, China has the world's largest population of disabled people. The world's leading accrued paint supplier, Windsor Paint Meter, wanted to raise awareness that the disabled deserve recognition and respect too. 16 handicapped people were recruited via social media to participate. First, they chose their paint colors. Then the colors were placed in balloons equipped with tiny detonators. Large canvas panels surrounded these balloons on all sides. By concentrating hard, electronic signals from their brains were captured and sent to a neurosky processing unit that triggered the detonators, which resulted in wonderfully abstract paintings. Exhibition to 22 cities around China 
with an average of 50,000 visitors per week. Some of the paintings were auctioned and earned over 800,000 RMB, which went to help disabled charities. The Mine Art Project exploded on TV stations, national press, and social media. Many opinion leaders retweeted and made it a big topic across China, finally reaching nearly 20 million media impressions for free. A happy side outcome was that the brand awareness of Windsor Newton went up 17% and sales rose by 6.6%.